started. Welcome everyone, good afternoon. Welcome to 10 Ways Exercise Will Improve Your Life. We do have some upcoming webinars as well for financial management as well as nutrition. Next week we'll be talking about managing student loan debt, Tuesday, February the 28th. Uh, we're going to celebrate America Saves Week with a webinar on savings as a family affair. And then our nutrition one next month is overcoming information overload, nu nutrition essentials you need. Okay, next slide please. Just want to remind you who we are and what we do. We are part of the Extension Service, which is a, the nationwide outreach from your local land-grant university. And we are part of a three-part university program, including research, education, and extension. And next slide. Universe, and here in Florida, we are part of the University of Florida. We have an extension presence in all 67 counties. Most have a family and consumer sciences agent which is what our webinar team is. And our webinar team includes Dr. Wendy Dahl, um, Wendy Lynch, who is in Putnam County. Wendy Dahl is at the University of Florida in the Food Science and Human Nutrition Department. Wendy Lynch is in Putnam County. I'm Julie England. I'm based in Seminole County. And Jamal Lepore, who is in Hillsborough County. And Wendy Lynch and Jamal Lepore will be our main speakers today. Just want you to notice on the next slide, you'll see what you, the box you should see, hopefully, which has a materials box for you to download information, a chat box where you can put your questions in to send to the entire um, audience or you can send them to the um, presenters. Also, you'll notice that there's a little right arrow up on the top of the box. If you right click it, it will give you the option to leave um, that box open during the entire presentation. And after the um, presentation, a little bit later today, we will be sending you a very short evaluation. And it's really important to us that you fill it out. It's important to help us improve and also to give us feedback for reporting purposes. And with that, I want to turn it over to our speakers to learn about 10 ways exercise will improve your life. Thanks, Julie. Um, so today, I mean, we know that, guys, that most Americans don't get the physical activity that we need, and that sedentary lifestyle is literally a killer. Um, many chronic diseases are associated with physical inactivity, and there's tons of evidence that inactive people of all ages can improve their health by becoming more, um, more active on a regular basis. And today, so what we're hoping that will help you to make a stronger connection between how exercise is a chronic disease prevention method emphasize the different types and amounts and intensity of exercise that's needed, and how exercise fits into weight control, body composition, how it impacts our energy, and overall benefits to enhance our quality of life. So physical activity or exercise. So throughout the presentation, you're probably going to hear us use exercise and physical activity interchangeably. Um, the National Institute of Health defines physical activity as any body movement that works your muscles and requires more energy than resting versus exercise, which is a type of physical activity that's planned. So it's something that's really intentional. We also included the word movement. So movement is defined as changing physical location or position. But pretty much if you look at physical activity, exercise, movement, they're all words that mean to get up and move or be active. So when you hear the word exercise or physical activity and you find yourself having some negative thoughts, it's time to reframe it, say, call it something else. So we use the word movement to help remove that negative association. Just kind of get yourself in the right mindset to approach activity. So what's recommended? Most of the health benefits you're going to see that we're, we'll talk about today are going to occur with about 150 minutes per week of moderate intensity physical activity. However, keep in mind that some activity is better than none. So look at the chart and let's look what the youth recommendations are. So those are for ages 6 to 17. And with youth, they need to aim for 60 minutes a day. And three of those days of the week, need to include vigorous activity. And we'll explain what the vigorous versus moderate intensity um, in an upcoming slide. So um, adults ages 18 to 64, aiming for that 150 minutes of moderate intensity. So remember I mentioned this is where some of those health benefits are going to kick in at that 150 minutes per week. Another option is, of course, going to 75 minutes of vigorous intensity. 
Um, but don't forget about that strengthening on two or more days as well. Now for older adults, you see that I've listed aerobic strengthening and balance training. So for older adults that have no limiting chronic conditions, they're actually going to follow the same recommendations that our adults do in that ages 18 to 64. Now if you do have limitations, the physical activity guidelines recommend to be as physically active as their abilities and conditions allow and make sure, of course, get approval from your health care provider. So again, if an older adult, which is considered that 65 plus, if they have no limiting chronic conditions, then at that point they would follow that adult uh, recommendation. So also balance training we wanted to highlight, even though this is important throughout our entire life, it's especially important for older adults because of fall preferred fall prevention. That resource you see below was one of our uh, materials in the materials box. It's the Exercise and Physical Activity Guide from the National Institute on Aging at the National Institute of Health. It's actually developed or uh, was developed for older adults, but I find it, I use it in all of my programming simply because if it's someone that's new to exercise or haven't, you know, hasn't really begun an activity regimen at all, it really gives you some basic ways to get started and gives you sample activities and I'll refer to a, a few of the pages in here. So if you haven't downloaded it, I highly recommend that you do. It's got some great information. So there's four types of physical activity and we'll start with balance. As we mentioned in the previous slide, this is to help prevent falls, especially for older adults. So some examples that are given in the book um, that I just mentioned, that resource from NIH is on page 65 and that includes standing on one foot, a heel to toe walk, and Tai Chi. So you could actually practice balancing as you're listening to the webinar. So practicing standing on one foot. Um, while you listen. So it's a twofer. All right, the next one is flexibility. So we want to stay limber for our daily activities, being able to tie our shoes, um, as well as whatever physical activities you choose to participate in. We want to be limber for those. So to increase our flexibility, we can try a shoulder and upper arm stretch, a calf stretch, or one exercise um, to try might be to practice yoga. And again, some of these are activities are going to be listed in the physical activity guide book. Endurance. Aerobic activities improve your cardiovascular fitness. Um, so we know this improves not only your cardio fitness, but just your overall fitness in general. So they're going to increase your heart rate. It, it's going to increase your breathing. And some examples would be a really brisk walk, swimming, climbing stairs, or even dancing. So endurance training. Then there's strength training. So strength is important for day-to-day -day tasks as well as to be able to maintain independence later in life. Um, muscle strengthening is a type of exercise that's going to increase your skeletal muscle. It's going to give you some power um, and definitely increase your endurance and muscle mass. So think about some of our older adults even, or adults for that matter, that maybe have difficulty taking out a gallon of milk out of the fridge. Um, so strength training is really important for just simple day-to-day -day tasks as well. Then there's bone strengthening, which is an activity that's going to produce an impact on the bones to promote uh, bone growth. One example would be running, jumping rope, um, another lifting weights. Um, on the physical activity guide resource um, I mentioned earlier, page 41 and 44 is going to give you a few examples of lifting weights as well as using a resistance band if you've ever used one before. They're fantastic and they can travel with you pretty much anywhere you go, even work. So here's the levels of intensity we were talking about a little few slides back is the moderate intensity versus vigorous intensity. So you can see the different types of act activities mentioned under each. Um, with moderate, when you're pr participating in moderate physical activity, you're, again, you're breathing, your heart rate's going to be noticeably faster, but you're still able to have a conversation. They always say use the talk test. Um, it's probably moderate intensity whenever you feel that increased heart rate and your breathing, again, is increased, but you can still chat with maybe your walking buddy. 
With vigorous, this is the part where you're, it's going to be a little more challenging to have that conversation. Your heart rate's going to definitely be increased substantially, and you're breathing really too hard and fast to have that conversation. So that's when you know you're in that vigorous intensity zone. So this is a great quote from the NIH. Uh, the benefits you gain from physical activity will depend on your starting point, and how much effort you put into it. So everybody that's on the webinar right now, is, if you are not engaged in physical activity, and even if you are, we're all going to be at a different starting point. Um, and just with as with anything, you're going to get return on how much effort or how much you actually put into it. So now we're moving in into those uh, the number one of the exercise benefits, and that's managing stress. So many people report managing their stress with exercise, and in our last presentation that we did, our last webinar on sleep more and stress less, several participants during the chat um, described strategies that they had used um, to reduce anxiety and daily stressors, and many of those strategies included different forms of physical activity, including walking, riding a bike, swimming. Um, we know that exercise is going to trigger a release of endorphins that are going to help to regulate pain and also give us that feeling of well-being or euphoria. And exercise is also, one of, this is my favorite, I think, is exercise is also a really great distractor from our stressors. So last webinar, we did talk a lot about st how stress impacts sleep and vice versa, but also talked about mindfulness. And if we're truly mindful of the physical activity that we're participating in, such as paying attention to the sound of your steps or your pace as you walk, or maybe listening to your breath, just the inhale and exhale, being completely present for that activity and you're truly mindful, you're going to be focused so much on that physical activity at hand, you won't even be thinking about your stressors. So, but keep in mind that small amounts of physical activity stimulate these anti-anxiety effects. So the next one is number two, improving sleep. And if you haven't, if you didn't participate in that last webinar, I highly recommend once we get that link up, um, the recorded link, I encourage you to go back. It has some fantastic information from Julie that on how exercise impacts sleep, but also just sleep in general and how to get better sleep. So we'll, we'll be able to send that out um, once it's been posted. So how does exercise impact your sleep? So if you see the little chat box, um, jump in right now. If you've ever done exercise in the past, how did it impact your sleep? Or did it? Or no change at all? So you sleep better after exercise? Mm -hmm. All right. Well, good. So it's good to know that some of you are, are stating what we what we are finding out, and what a lot of people report is that that consistent physical activity um, is going to help you fall asleep faster. It may even deepen your sleep. So individuals are going to respond to exercise completely different. So be cautious if you're one of those folks that exercise close to bedtime um, and you're super sensitive to activity prior to going to bed because you might get re-energized. Um, definitely this could interrupt your sleep. And then if you listened in in the last webinar, if you mess up your sleep, that's going to impact how you handle stress. And it goes into that vicious cycle round and round again. So. Um, we definitely want to be aware of how you respond personally to exercise. Number three is improved immunity. So the research shows that exercise does provide the body with anti-inflammatory effects, and it also is going to protect against some cancers, which we'll, I'll talk a little bit more about in an upcoming slide. But the best strategy to improve your immune system is to maintain your healthy lifestyle, which includes physical activity. You know, our bodies are just going to function better. They're going to protect itself better when we practice healthy and positive lifestyle behaviors. So here's the big one, the reducing risk of chronic disease. 
and other health conditions as well. We know that heart disease is the number one killer for both men and women. Happy Heart Health Month, by the way. Um, exercise is a great way to manage our risk uh, for cardiovascular disease. It's going to help individuals with normal blood pressure to maintain that pressure. And then those who have hypertension or individuals with hypertension can help reduce that uh, blood pressure. Now that's specific too if they are participating in that moderate intensity activity. So prevention of uh, type 2 diabetes and management. So consistent, again, the word, I think the, the key word is consistent physical activity can significantly, significantly reduce the risk of developing type 2. Um, exercise blood lowers blood glucose um, through insulin sensitivity is increased. So your cells are going to be better able to use any of that insulin to take up glucose during and after your activity. Also during physical activity, when your muscles contract, the body's able to take up glucose whether insulin is available or not, which is pretty cool um, given that physical activity has such an impact on lowering blood glucose just by moving. So here's some specifics on reducing cancer risk with exercise. Um, the most research has been done on colon and breast cancer from what I can find. Um, what we do know is that with exercise it does lower certain hormones and reduces risk for obesity which have been both shown to increase one's cancer risk. But exercise is going to help to reduce our risk by reducing inflammation in our bodies which we mentioned, improving our immune function as well as reducing the travel time for foods in the GI tract during digestion. So what that does is it reduces the exposure in your GI tract um, by not staying there for a long time to potential carcinogens. And another thing I'm sure that most of us like to see when we visit the doctor is improving our blood lipid profile with exercise. Um, exercise is going to reduce the LDL, which is the low density or the lousy pro uh, cholesterol, and raises our HDL, which is our healthy or happy, however you remember it. But both aerobic and strength training have been shown to improve our blood lipid profile. So some additional benefits that we have for exercise is while exercise is not a magic pill, it's not, it does slow down our age-related changes, but keep in mind many of our age-related changes are due to disuse. If we ever heard the statement, if you don't use it, you lose it, there you go. And I think Harvard Medical School said it best. They said, exercise is not the fountain of youth, but it is a good long drink of vitality, especially as a part of a comprehensive program. So the bottom line here, guys, is avoid inactivity. Um, and then an added bonus down there, and this is actually in that physical activity guidelines that's in the materials section, um, reducing our risk for premature death. So seven hours a week and have a 40% lower risk of dying early than those who are, um, are active for less than 30 minutes a week. So that's pretty powerful. 40% is a huge, huge rate. And number five, emotional well-being. So exercise stimulates the release of chemicals that affect our, um, our brain cells. So whether it's growth of new blood vessels in the brain, uh, impacts the amount and longevity of our new brain cells. We know it's in exercise helps to improve our memory function. And again, this is with consistent exercise. And it may also reduce symptoms of depression and can be extremely important for treating relapse for individuals previously diagnosed with a major depressive order. So exercise, um, and, I, and I, hopefully I'm not still in your th thunder, Jamila, but exercise truly is medicine, which she'll go into even more. All right. Well, thank you, Wendy. Um, and I will take the, the next five um, of our ways that exercise will improve your life. Um, so the first one, and this one is probably the biggest one and the one that most people are concerned with, is exercise can help control our weight and body composition. So I wanted to start out with just a question. So who has ever started an exercise program to lose weight? And I imagine that's probably quite a few of you. Um, and then what exercises did you choose? So if you guys see our little chat box, we're going to 
probably start doing this from now on to indicate we want you to chime in. Let's let's see what you guys have to say. So just enter in the chat box if you've started a program and and what exercises, what types of exercises did you choose to to lose weight? So we've got walking and biking. Yep. <laughs> Joining a Y, okay. Weightlifting and cardio. Treadmill wellness classes. So we've got a lot of people doing classes as well as walking, it looks like. Um, and that's something, too, I noticed even in, in most of those, most of you are saying uh, cardiovascular or aerobic uh, type activities, such as walking. Um, only one person, it looks like, really said anything about weightlifting. So we'll talk a little bit about both of those. Uh, so when it comes to weight control, um, to lose weight, how much exercise do we actually need? And what the research shows is that if we just look at exercise alone, so we're not looking at the diet, it really requires uh, quite a high amount in order to lose weight, which may be uh, surprising to some of you or it may be sort of um, upsetting because <laughs> I think that exercise for some people is easier to change than diet. So it re really, they're showing that you need to have more than that 150 minutes a week unless your diet is also adjusted. Uh, and so that goes with that the guidelines that Wendy presented in the beginning for um, the adults. So that's kind of the middle of the range we hear for, for most of our population. The greatest amount of weight loss is seen when we actually get up to 225 to 425 minutes per week. And that sounds really daunting just looking at that number, so I wanted to break it down to you. That's pretty much a, over 30 to 60 minutes a day. So that's kind of more in line with the recommendation that we actually have for children, which is the 60 minutes a day. And that would be for seven days a week. Uh, I also want to point out that this is for intentional exercise. So the casual stroll you know, down the block with your dog or walking into the grocery store is not really considered part of this activity unless you're walking at a good pace. If you're really just kind of taking your time, um, that's not the, the level of activity that, um, that we're looking for. And an, another thing too to point out, so uh, one thing that's really good is that you really only need to lose about 5 to 10 percent of your body weight in order to reap some of the benefits. And so some of the things that, that Wendy had talked about as well as what I'll go into is that it improves the cholesterol, the glucose metabolism, your triglycerides, um, and other risk factors for cardiovascular disease and other chronic diseases. So even just a modest amount of weight loss can actually make a, a big improvement. So one thing, too, I want to mention is even just maintaining weight, because sometimes we are at a healthy weight or we're just having difficulty losing weight. And so really maintaining weight can be beneficial as well. So to maintain weight, the exercise recommendations are pretty much what we are, what the current guidelines are saying. And that's that 150 minutes a week um, of moderate or the 75 minutes of vigorous. And that's of aerobic activity. So that's going to be, again, those walking, biking, swimming, those sort of things. Um, it's important to include strength training, too, but that's um, a separate issue. It, that's not going to be the, the – we're not going to get the biggest bang for our buck when it comes to maintaining our weight with those activities. And weight maintenance is really defined as um, keeping within 3% of your body weight. So – the exercises, if you meet the recommendations, you should be able to maintain your, your current weight and prevent that um, uh, prevent your weight from going up or down um, by 3%. That's assuming, too, that your diet stays the same. So you may have seen several headlines in the news, and, and this can be really confusing. So I, this is one of the the sort of hot topics I wanted to cover. You know, you got one media outlet that's saying how important exercise is to lose weight. And then, especially recently, I feel like in the last probably six months to a year, um, which is actually where I pulled um, some of these articles from, 
we've seen an influx of headlines on saying, oh, exercise doesn't matter for weight loss at all. Um, you know, you can see it here. Okay, don't freak out, but exercise doesn't make you lose weight. Why you can't exercise your way to weight loss? And they're really kind of diminishing the value of exercise when it comes to weight loss. So what's the real story here? What's, what's going on? <clears throat> well, if we consider just exercise alone, sometimes it's not enough. Um, these are the, and so these are the cases when we're just looking at exercise um, that we probably won't see weight loss. And I'll go into uh, exactly what each of those means. So first, <clears throat> sometimes we overestimate the calories that we burn. For instance, you get on the treadmill for 30 minutes. You know, some of you guys were saying that you did the treadmill and it tells you you burned 500 calories. But really that's just a, a calculation. Um, and maybe you really only burn 200 calories. And so you're putting it into your, you know, MyFitnessPal or you make up for it somewhere else and, and you think that you're burning more calories than you actually are. That's one of the, the biggest issues I think that we see with exercise. We burn a lot fewer calories in exercise than, than most of us think that we do. Um, secondly, you might underestimate how many calories you're actually eating. So you think, you know, why isn't exercise working? I work out six days a week and I'm meeting the recommendations for activity and I'm eating right, so you're doing all the right things, but you're still not losing weight. Uh, well, sometimes you might think you're only eating 1,800 calorie, uh, calories or so, and I'm just giving an example, um, but really you could be eating 3,000. You know, you may be forgetting about the cream and sugar you put in your coffee or the piece of chocolate you picked up at your coworker's desk. And it's those little things that really add up, I think, that a lot of us forget about. And sometimes we just underestimate too. We think like, oh, this salad is probably only 200 calories and the salad could be 1,000 calories. So it's just, uh, it, it's pretty easy to underestimate the calories we consume. And then finally, you might compensate for the activity. And I kind of alluded to this with the first one. So this can be done in um, a couple different ways. And the first one would be your mindset. So it could be that you've got the mindset, I just ran this 5K and I burned you know, all these calories, so I'm going to go enjoy this giant burger. And you probably didn't burn as much as you think that you did. Um, so it's kind of that mindset like, well, I deserve this because I exercised um, a, a lot. And the other thing is that exercise can, in some people, increase hunger. For some people, it decreases hunger. You really have to figure that out for yourself. But in, in some cases, it can increase hunger. And if this is you, you may end up overeating because you're simply more hungry. So in all three of these cases, um, it can basically sabotage the exercise effort we're doing, and then we won't see the weight loss. <clears throat> but what about body composition? Because right now we've just been talking about weight loss. So how does that fit in and, and does it matter? Um, and what exactly does body composition mean? I'm, I'm sure many of you have, have heard that term, especially in, in reading articles and videos and all the stuff that's out there now. Um, so for all intensive purposes, it's essentially your fat mass and your lean muscle tissue. Um, it is more complicated than that, but for the purposes of this webinar, we're just going to break it into that. So your fat and your muscle. And it's basically how much fat do you have relative to muscle. Um, and what the research is showing is that while diet may impact weight loss to a greater extent, exercise can actually influence the ratio of fat and muscle that you have. So it may not have as great of an impact on weight loss itself, but it can impact the um, how much again how much fat and muscle tissue you have and that's a bigger that's more important to your overall health than your exact weight um, I could have two people that both weigh 150 pounds and one person is a lean body and, and healthy athlete and the other person is really overweight because their body composition is different so just because you have a certain weight in mind it doesn't always tell the whole story um, and that's one thing that exercise really can impact is that body composition. So what research has shown, and I, I 
kind of mentioned this in the beginning, the resistance training, which would be any sort of strength training that we're doing, anything where we're working our muscles, this can be lifting weights, this can be body exercises, um, body weight exercises, excuse me, or even some of the classes and stuff have you doing certain things that really help you um, work on those muscles. And that combined with aerobic activity so that the walking and the biking and some of the other things you guys mentioned is better at improving your body composition than just aerobic activity alone. So the aerobic activity on its own can help with the weight loss, but resistance training and aerobic activity can help with both weight loss and body composition. So you're really going to get the biggest bang for your buck doing both. Um, it's It'll help you lose weight, maybe not as quickly as just doing aerobic activity, but that's because your body is sort of shifting and you're losing maybe more fat but gaining some muscle, and that's going to be the best, the best option. Um, and the other thing with resistance training is that it's not just going to change the, the muscle tissue and, and body fat, but, well, in doing that, what it does, so if, when you do resistance training and you increase your lean muscle tissue, you're going to um, raise your metabolic rate. And basically what that means is even just sitting on your butt and doing nothing, you're going to burn more calories because your muscle can burn more um, calories at rest. It takes more work to preserve that muscle. So the bottom line when it comes to weight loss and uh, body composition is that exercise can help with both weight loss and weight maintenance, though the degree to which might be a little bit smaller than we thought, and it's just based on some of those things that we discussed. The other thing is that it can improve body composition, which, as I said, is probably really more important than just weight loss. We focus so much on weight loss, but body composition makes a bigger difference. Um, we want to have that increased lean muscle and, and have less fat mass. Um, but weight loss aside, exercise is important for so many other factors, as we've already discussed with the first five and as we're going to discuss with the rest of this presentation. So number seven the next is increasing energy. So this is just another uh, benefit that we get from exercise. And I saw this quote somewhere, and, and I really kind of liked it because it's exercise when you don't want to. It's when you need it the most. So when, you know, when you're stressed out or you're feeling kind of just tired, sometimes it's a good time to exercise because it can boost energy and it can make you feel much better, uh, similar to what Wendy was saying as far as you know, producing those endorphins and, and even just making you um, your blood flow and, and you feel better. So this is a study that was done in 2008. And um, I'm not quite sure how to pronounce his name, so I won't say it. I probably would butcher it. Um, but basically, they were looking at the effect of aerobic activity on feelings of energy and fatigue in adults that were sedentary. So they weren't doing much, much activity. Um, and they had three different groups. So the first group was the control. And this group had absolutely no exercise at all. The second group was um, a low intensity exercise and the third group was a moderate intensity exercise. So they wanted to see was there a benefit with exercise at all and then did the intensity make a difference. Uh, so these individuals were put on a stationary bike and um, the group with no exercise obviously didn't do any activity and then the group with low or moderate intensity, they each had 20 minutes a day on the stationary bike and they did this for six weeks. Uh, what they found was actually a very good benefit as far as energy. So there was a 20% increase in energy levels, which is somewhat modest, but there was a greater than 50% drop in feelings of fatigue for both groups. So even at the low intensity, um, people were still able to see a benefit in reduced feelings of fatigue. <clears throat> So how, did, how does this work? How do we get more energy? And like the previous study and many others like it have shown, uh, choosing low and moderate intensity activities to engage in throughout the day can improve our energy. And so again, that's going to be those aerobic activities. So walking, biking, swimming, jogging, dancing, anything that really gets your body up and moving and your heart rate uh, up. 
And so you can do this activity all at once or you can break it up into smaller intervals. I tend to like to say 10 minute intervals because I think any less than that, you're, you kind of like just get your heart rate up and then you're pretty much done if you, if you do less than that. So you could do it in smaller intervals if you needed to, but um, we like to see, or I, I think I like to see 10 minutes is, is a better option. Um, and we want to get at least the 20 minutes of activity a day, and that's in line with that 150 minutes per week. So why does this work? So basically, when we are doing these aerobic activities, our blood flow increases. And when our blood flow increases, we have more blood and oxygen circulating throughout our body. The result is that we feel more energized. And this, this extends usually after exercise as well. So we have this effect afterwards. So we, may we feel more energized while we're exercising and then even after you feel uh, much better because that that process is still going on. All right, so number eight, so enhancing stability and mobility. And I first wanted to give you just a few definitions because some of you may not heard these terms before, at least in respect to exercise. Um, so stability is defined as the resistance to change position or ability to remain balanced. And mobility is the ability to move in a set range of motion. Um, so how well can you move through these different ranges of motion? So why do you think that we need stability and mobility? And this is another time I want to turn to the chat box. Um, just type in. There's no right or wrong answers. We're just curious to see uh, where you guys are at. Why, why do you think that these two things are important? Anybody? <laughs> Avoiding falls, yep. Okay, we got two people saying the falls. To be able to exercise. Endurance, not so much, but we'll, we'll get into why they're important. Flexibility, okay. So why we need stability and mobility um, is for a few different reasons. So flexibility is, is basically, it's kind of is related to both, really. It's really the combination of stability and mobility. And flexibility declines as we age because muscles shorten. And basically, when they're shortened, they get much stiffer. So shortened muscles make the risk of falling and activities that require flexibility much higher, um, or much harder, I'm sorry. And some of those activities that require flexibility are things like climbing the stairs, you know, reaching for a plate, just daily activities, walking around to do errands, or even playing with your kids or your grandkids. And so that's why it's really important because, again, as we age, those things are going to decline. So we really need to focus on exercises that can um, enhance stability and mobility. So the other thing is that exercise can improve existing stability and mobility and really prevent future age-related loss. So like Wendy said, yes, in that older adults category, it's important to focus on balance, um, but it's really important for us to focus on it throughout our life to really prevent some of those age-related declines that are going to happen unless we do something proactively. Um, and so by exercising, our coordination and our balance can be improved. So this is kind of an interesting uh, way of looking at stability and mobility. Our body is made up of alternating points of stability and mobility. And it's basically just so that we can function properly. And this doesn't mean that if it's in the stability category, it doesn't have any mobility or vice versa. It's really just a, a general rule of thumb. This is the primary function of these joints. Um, so the glenohumeral joint, which is basically the connection between your shoulder and your arm, um, you know, this has to be able to be mobile so that you can, you know, raise your arm up to pick something up um, or even uh, just to reach out or to, to do anything, you need to be able to move that, that joint. Your scapulothoracic joint needs to be stable. So this is where the scapula, which is basically your upper back, attaches to the thorax. And this is not so much a joint as a spot where they meet. But if it's stable, it means that our scapula is working properly and keeping our, um, our upper body aligned and, and upright. 
our thoracic spine needs to be mobile. So this is the, the upper part of our spine. And it's got um, your shoulder attachments, your clavicle, your ribs, um, and that's all attached in this area. So we want to think of, think of all the movement that comes from our upper back, our shoulders, our chest. We want to be able to be mobile. Um, it's also important, again, in maintaining good posture. Our lumbar spine is also needs to be or needs to be stable, um, and this is really this is kind of our core area. This is we talk about. Um, our back as well as our core muscles, our abdominal muscles, and that's important, again, to keep us upright. And so we want that to be really stable. Um, when it's not, a lot of times that's when people will start to develop some uh, back pain. And sometimes it's because the lumbar spine is not stable or it's because either our, our hips or, um, well, here, let me say this. Okay, so the, the pieces that are surrounding each one, so for instance, the lumbar spine, it is also impacted by the thoracic spine and the hip. So if the hip is not mobile, the lumbar spine can become less stable. Or if the thoracic spine is not mobile, the lumbar spine can become less stable. So it kind of impacts the ones that are next to it. And that's why, again, a lot of people will get lower, they'll have lower back issues because they their hips might not be mobile and so they're they're out of alignment and it affects their, their lower back. And that's very common because we are often sitting and that'll affect our hip mobility. Um, and then the knee and the foot obviously pro provide stability because you want to be able to keep your balance and your ankle needs mobility so that you can do things like walking. Um, if our, our ankle wasn't mobile, then we would be kind of, we would walk a little bit awkwardly. <laughs> So these are all important um, to obviously do normal daily activities, and again, each one can affect the other. So it's really important to have mobility and stability in each of these places on our body. So number nine is to reduce physical ailments or, or physical uh, problems and difficulties that we have. So what is the problem? You know, I mentioned briefly that muscles can shorten as we age, but they can also shorten from prolonged periods of inactivity. For instance, sitting. You know, I, I alluded to that with the um, with our, our hip mobility having um, issues and then affecting our, our lower back. The other way it can shorten is lack of use. So if anyone had to be casted or... Um, or had a splint or something, the muscles can shorten during that time as well. And that's why typically if you had some sort of injury like that, you have to do physical therapy once you are healed because your muscle hasn't been, been used in a while. And some of the common concerns um, are, you know, achy joints, low back, knee or neck pain, and then joint and muscle stiffness. And a lot of these are related to the stability and mobility issues. If we're not taking care of that, then we're going to start to to have some of these issues. <clears throat> so exercise um, improves both bone strength and muscle strength. And um, first, we're going to discuss bone strength. And so this is directly from the CDC that um, aerobic muscle strengthening and bone strengthening activity of at least a moderate intense level can slow the loss of bone density that comes with age. So again, it's very important to be engaging in not just aerobic activity as we get older, but also the resistance training and not just for our muscles but and our body composition, but also for our bone health. Um, it can also help with, uh, with conditions such as arthritis and other joint issues. Uh, research shows that doing the 130 to 150 minutes, which is about two to two and a half hours a week of moderate intensity activity, can not only improve your ability to manage the pain, but it can also make your quality of life better. <clears throat> and of course, muscle strength. You know, this is the, I think, the more obvious one, but stronger muscles will support proper posture and alignment. And this is especially true of our core muscles. And our core muscles are not just our abdominals. Again, it's also those muscles that are in our, our lower and, and upper back. It's that, that whole area is considered our core. Um, and it's not just about getting a six pack, it's also just about having good posture and alignment because again, if those are out of alignment, then the rest of our body starts to compensate. Um, and then the other thing is that our muscles really learn to coordinate through strength training and, and especially if we're using proper form. Um, 
our, our muscles start to remember things. And this is very important when it comes to daily activities. You know, if you go to pick something up off the floor, but you are not able to get down to a squat, then you're gonna probably lean over and not pick it up properly. And that can, over time, you can start, your, your uh, shoulders will start to come forward, your back will start to hunch over, and you won't be, you ha you're also at increased risk of injury doing that. So if you are doing some of these things that can help you um, pick things up properly, for instance, or do other daily activities the way that you need to, because you're translating what you've learned in, um, in the gym or at home or whatever, doing your resistance training and applying it to your everyday activities. So when it comes to physical ailments, you know, it, if we're showing it has all these substantial impacts, and why aren't we hearing more about this? Um, I think most of the emphasis on exercise really is on the body weight and body composition. And of course, a lot of us really care about that because, you know, we're human and we want to look good and, and stuff in our, and look good and feel good in our own skin. But it's also important, again, for um, because of all of these other things that it can do. <clears throat> so in response to that, in 2007, um, the American Medical Association and American College of Sports Medicine decided to launch an initiative called Exercise is Medicine. Um, this was just an, a U.S. initiative, but it's since grown and is now a global effort. Um, the purpose of that, of this initiative, is to make the scientifically proven benefits of physical activity the standard in the U.S. healthcare system. So we do hear a lot about in healthcare about nutrition, and there's a lot of emphasis on that, but we're not hearing as much about exercise. So they're really trying to push that exercise is important for our health and that it needs to be talked about more. Uh, the vision of exercise as medicine is to have healthcare providers assess their each patient's level of physical activity um, and determine if they're meeting the guidelines, as well as to provide them with some sort of counseling or to refer them to a healthcare or community-based resource in order to get them doing the physical activity that they really need. <clears throat> And so this is directly from the exercise as medicine. So for those individuals who have chronic pain, these are just their top tips in order to manage chronic pain. And I think that a lot of these can apply to people that don't have chronic pain. I think they're important really just for overall health. So choosing exercise that you enjoy. You may not enjoy going to the gym and lifting weights. That's okay. There's other ways to do strength training. Maybe that means being part of a class um, or doing some body weight stuff at home. There's other ways to enjoy that and, and figuring out really what do you truly like. Consider some form of aerobic exercise in all programs. You know, like I said before, I think it, we a lot of us will pick one or the other, and I think it's really important to have both aerobic and resistance training. Uh, we also, again, we want to have some of those stability, mobility, sort of balance and flexibility things included as well. Realizing that some discomfort with exercise is acceptable. Uh, and again, I think a lot of these will apply to anyone. Um, some, some discomfort with exercise is, is normal. You're not always going to feel spectacular while you're exercising, particularly if you're just starting out. Um, but overall, it's going to help you feel much better later on and in the long run. And that's really what's more important. If you're ever feeling pain, that's different, but having some discomfort is normal. Um, avoiding exercise that causes pain to continually increase or spread down the arms and legs, and that's, again, true for really anyone, not just those with chronic pain. Uh, starting slowly and being consistent is definitely important, and some people, just like with diet, they'll go from zero to 60 and, and go from I'm not doing any activity at all to I'm working out you know, 60 minutes a day for six days a week, and then they can't keep up with it. So just start slowly, because consistency is more important than meeting the guidelines right away. Um, slowly, okay, and then the next thing, slowly pacing the exercise by increasing volume first and then intensity, and I'll explain that briefly on the next slide. Or finally, considering a professional to help you with exercise. So this is sort of the practical aspect. So how do we actually strengthen our muscles and bones to reduce some of the physical ailments as well as um, really just reaping some of the health benefits even with exercise? Well, we have to progressively increase what we're doing. And volume that can be done through volume 
and or intensity. So volume is the amount of time you're spending on an activity. Um, and so for instance, to steadily increase volume, which is what we would wanna do first, you wanna increase volume before you increase intensity, it would be, let's say you start out and you can only walk for 15 minutes. So then the next time you go, you can do it for 20 and then 25 and then you work up to 30. Um, with strength training to increase the volume, it would be you start out doing just one set of squats and then you're able to do two sets and then three sets and you can kind of pick what your target is. Um, it, there's no set you know, requirement for how much you should increase the volume. There is probably a limit on your time, for instance. You know, if you only have 45 minutes to be able to do something, then you know that you're limited by that amount of time. So if you are maxed out on your volume, then you next want to increase your intensity. And your intensity will be how hard you're working for that activity. So going from walk, maybe you, you like I said, with the walking, okay, so you started out walking and you went from 15 minutes to 30 minutes. Well, let's add some jogging intervals. So now you're jogging for 15 minutes or a few minutes within that 15 minutes uh, if you can't do the full 15. And you just keep steadily increasing the intensity. Same thing with strength training. So with strength training, the way to increase intensity is, or one way to increase intensity is to increase the weight that you're lifting. So you start out lifting five pounds and then you can work up to 10 and 20 and so on, depending on, of course, the activity that you're doing. And then finally, uh, you know, a way that exercise can benefit your life is it's a source of pleasure in and of itself. Um, you know, exercise can be enjoyable. It, like I said before, you want to find something that's fun and an activity that you enjoy doing. Um, it can be social, part of, you know, if you're part of a team or a class. And also it can just feel good physically. Um, it increases your endorphins. It can improve your confidence and even make you feel accomplished for doing something. So one thing is that um, there's two kind of types of motivation, and most of us will start out with extrinsic motivators, and a lot of times um, those are still going to be a piece of our motivation, even if they're not the primary source of motivation. So extrinsic is basically those external factors that motivate us to exercise. So we start out because we want to lose weight or because we're part of a group that is losing weight and they want to do it. Um, we get diagnosed with diabetes and we want to improve our, or we want to start exercising. Or even something like being part of a competition or a game. It's anything that's external to ourselves. Um, <clears throat> it, you know, it could also be that you had a reunion to go to. I mean, it's really anything that's external. Uh, and this can be, like I said, a great way to initiate exercise, but it doesn't really work long term on its own. It is still a component that can be considered, but we don't want it to be the primary source of exercise, the, or the primary motivation of exercise. What we want the primary motivation to be is intrinsic. So this comes from within. We want to exercise just for exercise's sake. Um, this is going to take much time and consistency to develop. You know, the best example of people of uh, individuals that have intrinsic motivation to exercise are children. So you think when you're a child, you don't have to. I mean, maybe once they get older and start playing video games, but when they're very, very young, you don't have to tell them to be active. They just are. They're very active. It's something that they just want to do. They're compelled to do. And that can you can have that same feeling when you're an adult, I promise you. I have a very high intrinsic motivation to exercise. I just don't feel good if I don't do some activity, even if it's something simple like just walking. Um, it really does, you know, of course, depend on the day. but. It, the goal really is, again, this comes really from time and consistency. And again, I think consistency <clears throat> more important than anything when it comes to developing that. The more you do it, the more you feel the benefits and you really just, it just becomes part of your life. So these are just some ideas that, like I said, exercise is fun. It doesn't have to be something that's daunting and miserable. You can find things that you enjoy doing. Um, it can be, you know, really rewarding. So just to summarize of the, the 10 things that we discussed today, you know, exercise can improve your life. It can help you manage stress and improve your sleep. It can improve your immunity, reduce your risk of chronic disease. It can have, you can have um, improved emotional well-being. 
It may help control your weight, but it definitely can help control your body composition. It gives you increased energy. It can enhance your stability and mobility and also reduce physical ailments and be a source of pleasure in and of itself. And then we really just wanted to end with uh, this quote. It's nice. So exercise helps to keep our brains and hearts strong so we can be sharp and independent well into our golden years. So it really is a long-term uh, solution to so many things. And these are our sources, and you guys will have those in the handout, so you can feel free to access those there. Um, just a reminder, too, we, we will do, I will, we will have uh, questions. We have just a few minutes, I think. I talked a little bit longer than I thought I would. Um, but we want to remind you to please complete the uh, evaluation that will be sent to you. Uh, we really, really value your feedback. It helps us improve the webinars and, um, and come up with the topics that you guys are looking for. So with that, do, does anyone have any questions? No? <laughs> Unless someone's still typing? All right, well, it doesn't look like anyone has any. So, um, oh, missed the sleep webinar. Um, Julie, do you know how to get that to them? Okay, is moderate exercise in one's target heart rate? I'm not sure what you're asking, Dennis. Uh, I mean, there is a target heart rate that they're gonna, that each person is going to have based on and there's going to be moderate and vigorous levels for each person depending on a variety of things your age your um, physical fitness your um, any medications or conditions you might have so that's going to really vary from person to person there are calculators out there but just like the calculators for calories they're not exactly accurate i would definitely talk to either a certified personal trainer or your physician regarding that um, to find out exactly what your target heart rate is for moderate exercise. You're welcome to everybody that's saying thank you. <laughs> We're glad that you appreciated this webinar. Um, and I guess with that, we will conclude because it doesn't look like anyone else is asking any questions. Um, our next webinar is, where's the slide? Hold on. Let me go back to the slide. Okay. Can you see that? That shows our next webinar. And where to register. Okay, thank you guys.